Andrew, our big get today, Burke Magnus, number two at ESPN, the guy that's involved with all the rights deals. We talked to him for a long time. He breaks a little bit of news with us too. By the way, though, John, how do you say your name? Is it Oring and Orand? I mean, I know you're, you you have good spots with people, but can you tell us how you say your name? With uh, our good buddy there, John Alrad. Is that how you pronounce his name? Who does a great job with all the media stuff, uh, and he's got that great um, website, and he works with uh, Andrew Marshawn on a podcast. And we're back. The Marshan and Oran Sports Media Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshan, sports media columnist for the New York Post. And he is, is it John Oran? Oran? <laughs> you got that web, that great website. Hey, I thought you were Marshan. You had that, what, Marshan? Marshan? What, I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. Chris Russo, Mad Dog in the Hall of Fame. You all, haven't all made it. In, you haven't made it until Chris Russo mispronounces your name. So thank is, you, Mad Dog. Thank you very honestly, much. That's a keeper. Uh, for the rest of your career, arguably the greatest sports talk show host of all time. Uh, it's John Orand, right? Orand, you got it. Perfect. Orand. All right. <laughs> we have Berg Magnus already recorded it. You guys are going to hear that. We go about 50 minutes with him. Uh, we hit on every conference you could think of in terms of what's going on from the Big Ten to the Pac-12 to the Big 12. What's next? some ACC news involving college basketball. You know, not really, I, I wouldn't say news, but something that maybe could happen. First though, who's up and who's down? Who's up? Who's down? All right, Andrew, lead us off. My who's up, your guy, Eric Shanks. I mean, and Mark Silverman, the whole group at Fox Sports. Because Larry Jones. Larry Jones, everybody. All right. Andrew for Garcia put him in there. You know, Zager, Tom Brady, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Matt Singer. Who's up is Fox. I'm going to tell you why. Like, you look at this Big Ten deal. We, you know, it happened last week. We we did the podcast already, uh, you know, but we, you know, we talked about it a lot. Now it's been announced. But the reason for me, Fox, you know, gets my who's up is because I think this Big Ten deal is incredible for them. They're, you know, we don't know exactly how much money that they're contributing, but they're part of the Big Ten. You know, they own a, a large component of the Big Ten network. They led these negotiations along with the Big Ten commissioner, Kevin Warren, and they're going to have the top game. They have big noon kickoff, which they're going to be on the road every week. Um, that's going to probably expand. Uh, they hired Urban Meyer. Um, and they don't want anybody to know what they hired Urban Meyer with a little Friday news dump, a little expertly done that, you know, we all, oh, you, you hired Urban Meyer. Okay. But he was good on TV. So I like what they did. And I also think when you look at where things are going, you know, in terms of where the national championship rights could go eventually, ESPN owns them for a few more years, but they're probably in play for those. And, and they saved a lot of uh, money, you know, in terms of this deal. And they got one of the top conferences, though. I, I like the deal. Uh, for CBS, uh, getting that 3.30 window when they lost the SEC to ESPN. NBC, uh, they needed more college football, so I like it for them. Not great, obviously, for Amazon. They're on the outside looking in again. But I think Fox, if you look at it, they're, they're the big winners in terms of uh, who's up and who's down uh, for me for this week. I don't think you can ignore them. Uh, my who's up? Uh, Mike McCarley, the former head of Golf Channel, who is apparently a devoted podcast listener, Andrew. He told me, he goes, don't tell Marshand I listen to the podcast. I, so I, I'm not telling you that. All right. No, I didn't hear it. Good job. Uh, Mike, as Live Golf is coming uh, in and taking PGA Tour golfers and, and really disrupting the whole golf scene, Mike McCarley has gotten together and launched a, a company with Rory McIlroy and Tiger Woods that is designed to really make golf younger, use a lot of technology. They're going to use uh, do stadium events, so they're not going to be playing on grass and just try to go from January through March, just trying to make golf more accessible uh, to the masses. Uh, it's, it's an interesting idea. He has really big names behind it. Dick Ebersol is in, in there. Uh, John Collins used to be with the uh, NHL is, uh, is on, in on it as well. It has as good a chance of working as anything. All right, who is down? Who do you got? Uh, who's down? I got to go with Amazon again, Jeff Bezos on Thursday, the big 10 deal came out and Amazon was not part of it, even though they bid more than, than every other network. The very next day, 
the Champions League came out. They were very aggressive to try to get the Champions League and they couldn't get it. They went, the Champions League ended up going to, to CBS. So I know you like Amazon strategy. I like Amazon strategy too, to be honest, uh, but the strategy only works if they get the rights. And so far, people have been really scared about tethering their rights to a, to a streamer like Amazon when there are uh, traditional media companies that bring uh, mass audiences to watch them. So it's a, a big problem that they're, that they're going to have to continuously deal with. All right, my who's down, Brian Stelter. Let go from CNN. I think Stelter does a really good job. He's had an unbelievable career when you look at it. He's only, I think, 36 years old, started TV Newser, went to the Times, then CNN uh, for a decade. So this really, we put the who's down in because, you know, the Oran rule of the podcast, you got to name names because he's a bad guy. Um, and so uh, <laughs> I named Stelter here. Um, and so, but I, I'm interested, I'm curious to see what he does next. Um, you named Stelter. You should have named uh, Chris Licht, who oversees CNN, Dr. John Malone. Who's I could have done them. The it's more interesting there. to do Stelter, though. Uh, all, right? all right. I do work for the New York Post, so I go for Stelter. No, but I think he does a great job. Um, uh, reliable sources newsletter. Excellent. Not only because he always referenced my stories and yours, um, but uh, that's the big reason why that it's succeeded, I think. And um, I'm really curious, though, quite honestly, I have my news down, but really I'm looking to see where he ends up um he, he has helped make this a niche um you know a big niche um supposedly he's making a million bucks a year uh according i think to the time said that uh and so uh i think he'll have big things and big opportunities and it will be interesting to see what's next for him um and i do think really like, who's down cnn getting rid of some media coverage that's ridiculous everyone loves i want to see what cnn does with their media coverage i know oliver darcy is supposed to, uh, is yeah. stepping up to try to do it but that leaves a gaping hole there for what seemed to be getting good traction over at CNN. It 100% was. I, look, it's a little weird. We all have this. You no matter who you work for, unless you have your own blog and you don't take ads, there's no way not to sort of have this conflict, right? If you're going to be part of it, it was a little, you know, odd, not perfect. I mean, I think he tried to keep it as straight as possible. But when you work for CNN and then you're always talking about other networks and stuff, it's not a perfect scenario. So it'll be interesting to see what he does um, in his next move and who he aligns himself with, or maybe does goes alone, uh, but he has a big following. So uh, hopefully he'll have a success in his next endeavor, but CNN, hopefully they do keep media coverage because, you know, they, they do have Oliver, as you mentioned um, in, in, in Oliver Darcy, uh, but, uh, but it'll be interesting to see where that goes. All right, Andrew, we have uh, Burke Magnus coming on. We go extra long with Burke. I believe that this is the longest interview that we've done on, on this pod. So with our topics, let's just run through them. Let's do quick hitters. UEFA, what's your big takeaway? Well, I thought it would come down to CBS and Amazon, which it did. CBS, it just shows how important soccer is to these streamers you know sean mcmanus you did an interview with them where he said it's the third most important thing after the nfl and what was the series 1863 it's 1883 1883 you're off by a couple of decades all right. all right whatever i never heard of it so good for them that that show is doing well but i actually though think that is indicative of where sports is value is for these streamers right because you do a six-year deal and that's why it's important that uefa made it six years and that allows you to create programming that's sticky programming right the ted lassos for apple um you know game of thrones etc for hbo max and we go on and on and i think if you're paramount you're going to keep these soccer fans for six years and then it becomes a normal part of what you pay for and what you have to have and i think um when you look at it um i've, I've said this before you look at champions league it's not something you're going to cancel it goes for like six to eight months um, in terms of the competition, even though they only play like a couple of times a, a month. Uh, and so I think it made a lot of sense. Uh, you know, UEFA got a big number. And I think when you look at properties, obviously Fox with the World Cup's number one, but it's only every four years. And then I would say in terms of value though, but I would say that's not even, obviously only once every four years and it's for a little more than a month. Um, so that doesn't really have its value. When you talk about streaming value, I would say the Premier League's one, uh, which Peacock and NBC have, and then two is Champions League uh, in terms of the most important. If I were picking a hierarchy of soccer value and then uh, MLS and Apple is a little bit further down, like way down. 
Yeah, I, I just want to echo what you said. Six year, $1.5 billion deals. McManus said it uh, helped drive sub new subscribers and retain existing subscribers. And that is exactly what these streamers are looking for, that type of programming. And the streamers have figured out that soccer programming more than other programming gets it. And that's because soccer fans are ardent, they're avid, and, and they want to see those games. Yeah, and there's a lot of soccer too. That's the other thing. It's not just like there's the NFL and that's the only league. There's a lot of basically nobody's the NFL. The Premier League's probably the closest. Champions League is next up in terms of a competition, uh, but there's a lot. So, you know, and they haven't even sold the Spanish language rights. So that number is going to be even higher uh, when you put those two together after they sell the Spanish language rights. Good job by CBS. And like you said, Amazon, uh, you know, they can't get people, at least in the States. I mean, they're doing well overall. Um, but there's a lot of competition in the States. They can't get those deals. It's a mature sports market. And that's what Amazon is finding out right now. Uh, let's go to our next topic. Topic two, we were on vacation. Uh, an activist investor got into Disney, Daniel Loeb, and is uh, calling on uh, Disney and Bob Chapek to spin ESPN off. Uh, I know that they have talked about this uh, inside Disney for a, you know, a couple of years. It's got, gotten hot, it's gotten cool. It's been cool for a while from what I've heard. Uh, I, I don't expect anything to come of this other than Daniel Loeb making like a lot of money because activist investors always seem to. What's yeah, your so take explain on about, yeah, You're the business, you're from the sports business journal. So I'm gonna ask you a question, hopefully you can answer. We didn't talk about this pre-taping. Um, from his perspective, right, if you're Daniel Loeb, right? Is he trying just to get them to do that? Because that will immediately drive up the price. If that were to happen, then he sells and he's out and that's good for him, but maybe not good for the long-term business of Disney. Like what is the move there? Do you understand that? Right now, if you look at ESPN, it used to be the shining star of every quarterly earnings call that Disney ever had. Now it's become a somewhat of a drag. They spent a lot. You're going to talk about this with uh, Burke Magnus. They spent a lot of money on rights for ESPN Plus. They're spending a ton more money on rights uh, for, for ESPN. And as they're doing it, the subscribers are dropping. So their revenue is not necessarily dropping from the affiliates because it keeps increasing, but it, it, it's a it's a tough, tough business to look at. And especially as you look down the future, where's ESPN gonna be? And there are a lot of activist, activist investors that look at Netflix and look at other streamers that aren't encumbered by sports rights and that aren't encumbered by legacy media that see that as a path forward. My personal view on that though, is that ESPN is still a great business. My I agree, that's what I was gonna say. Cable, we had Michael Nathanson on. Cable's not going down to zero. It's going to plateau at, at some point and at $10 per subscriber per month, it's more than that now. I mean, it's still a, a very good business and we can see also from what's happening with Amazon, like, like th th this is for, for uh, legacy media companies and, and uh, traditional linear television companies, it's still a, a pretty good business. Yeah, I agree. It's it's a it's a misnomer like ESPN's like going anywhere. It's just yeah, it's not as big a business. But I, I just also could see there could be a transformation where it becomes like you know the best business again. Like I again, I think it's already a good business, right? I just don't think. The, the pie is getting cut a little bit more. And so it's not as amazing of a business. But I also think if like you're Disney, like I think one of the thing is like the reason Disney has been successful over the last 30 years, if you look at Bob Iger, who's one of the great executives of all time. But if you really look at what really drove his success, it was ESPN, which he had nothing to do with acquiring. It wasn't even the main part of when they did acquire it. So they kind of lucked out there. That allowed them to buy all these Pixar's and you know, Fox's assets and everything else, which has driven their growth. I just don't know where you're selling it, where it's good for you, right? Like, I don't, you know, we always talk about Apple and Amazon. I don't know if they would buy it, but like, why would you want to give Apple and Amazon your ESPN business if you're Disney on the stream? And when you want that on your side, I get it that you're only leasing the programming and there are some problems, you know, with, you know, where the future is going, for them. I don't know. I just think you want that long-term on your side. So I kind of, I tend to agree with you. Um, or, and if they did do it, I think it'd be, you still have to maintain some sort of, of the revenue coming to Disney. If you're, uh, if you're Disney and you were to spin off ESPN. All right. Topic three, RSN moves. There's been an RSN sale. Uh, the, uh, in my hometown, NBC sports, Washington, Comcast is in the process of selling that the Ted Leonsis and monumental sports and entertainment it is a purchase 
that is certain to raise eyebrow. Who on earth would want to get into the RSN business right now? But uh, the, the Monumental and the uh, Leontes is Ted and Zach Leontes. They have Monumental Sports Network. It's a streaming service. They have a lot of learnings that they got from that streaming service. And, and uh, you know, they promise that they're going to be able to do more with this uh, RSN because they own the teams, the Wizards, the Capitals, the Mystics. They own the building, uh, Capital One Arena. And now they're going to own the, uh, the RSN that's associated with it. And they think that, that they'll be able to work with that and, and hit whatever the f- future may hold for these local rights. The, bi- the basic point there, uh, which is undeniable, is that local sports rights are still totally valuable. It's just they're now sort of stuck in an RSN system that was perfect for the 2000s. Uh, but might be uh, sort of at the end of its shelf life right now. I think the RSNs too, that's the one where you kind of look at the digital world and like the MLS deal and you wonder, and ESPN Plus as well, like do eventually, uh, you know, all these regional rights end up in that kind of situation. I mean, the Yankees, Randy Levine, their team president and, you know, had a yes. You know, he said recently that they're going to have a direct to consumer product um, with yes, I would have Imagine that's going to happen, you know, by the time baseball season at the latest uh, begins next year. Uh, and so that, you know, that's where the business is going, but can they create the same revenue? Well, it will be interesting because uh, the Leontes, it's they own 33% of their RSN right now. They're going in, they're going to own the entire thing, the, the, the full RSN. And if anybody can do it, Ted, Ted Leontes, the old AOL executive, you know, he's uh, been a visionary for a lot of things. They're, they're the ones that could uh, figure this out. All right, John, let's hit a couple more topics before we get to Burke Magnus. Uh, women's sports to broadcast TV. Um, you know, I've been a big proponent of that women's sports is really an area of growth. You just see it in the ratings, right? Like just do it to, to, to do it, to be fair or anything like that. There's numbers to support this. There's audiences out there. Uh, CBS is going to put the NWSL final on primetime TV up against game two of the World Series. We'll get a great number. Like, I think it'll do okay. I think it'll do okay. Um, but that's how you reach people. Like, that's like what the, like, that's when you talk about the MLS and what they're doing. And I don't want to, we're, we're talking on women's sports here. Out of sight, out of mind a little bit. You get on CBS, it feels bigger. It feels more important. And I think that's how you really get growth because people see it. And I, you could say what you want about legacy media. It still means something. I see it. You probably see it. I see it when certain entities that are kind of the new thing, they want to be in the New York Post, right? It means something to them to still be in that, you know, on the website, in the newspaper. It still gives them um, a little bit more of like they made it. And I do think this is something that could be a landmark uh, for the NWSL. Yeah. And the uh, ESPN moving the women's basketball tournament NCAA final to ABC uh, as well as as another one out there. These are for-profit companies, Andrew. They're not doing this to to, to lose money. You know, they're, they're, there's a reason that they're putting their uh, marketing might behind women's sports. Uh, next topic, you know, just one quick Big Ten update. I uh, I wrote about this earlier. Uh, everybody's talking about expansion, and they think that there are that, these escalator clauses that are in these contracts, so that if they bring in Oregon, uh, the the networks are all going to have to pay more in, in in order to get this. Well, that's not the case in the Big Ten. That's been the case historically. That's not the case in the Big Ten. What I've been told is that each one of these contracts identifies Notre Dame and assigns an, a, a specific value to Notre Dame should that school join the Big Ten. But if any other school, Oregon, Stanford, Cal, if they join the Big Ten, the only thing that happens is that the, the, the networks have said that they will have a good faith conversation about what to pay. And I think you probably know how that good faith conversation will go, don't you? We are talking in good faith and we are not going to give you any more money. Exactly. Uh, probably is how it would go. Uh, note your Dave. That is interesting, though. Uh, it'd be interesting to know what that number is, too, um, because... If Notre Dame wants to do their own deal, it starts at whatever number that is. Um, and so uh, you'd have to figure it's definitely, uh, I'm trying to figure out how many numbers in a hundred million. What is that? Ten, nine figures? Uh, nine <laughs> figures. Yeah, nine figures. Definitely nine figures, um, I would think. So uh, I could be wrong. I don't really know. That's speculation. But it's definitely a big number. And it just shows you where the Big Ten and all the networks are thinking in terms of Notre Dame. All right. Amazon Thursday night football. Some people are probably already listening to this over the weekend. Uh, so Thursday night football, their first preseason game in Houston's taking place. 
uh, Amazon gets on the board. This doesn't really count to me. You know, second week of the season, Chiefs, Chargers, that's the real opening day for them. But it is significant. Uh, first game, Herb Street, Michaels, Hartung, the whole crew, Fidelli, uh doing their first game. Um, and, and Amazon is now, you know, the exclusive home of Thursday Night Football. And it, it starts preseason-wise uh, this Thursday. Final topic. Uh I couldn't let the pod go out without bringing up the Orioles, but the Orioles were in the little league classic, which means that I was uh, paying a lot more attention to the little league classic than I have in the past it was the Orioles versus the Red Sox. And I just want to take my hat off to the, uh, Mark Gross and all of the ESPN production team, because what they did in that was uh, what was in terms of the access that they got to the players in terms of just sort of like the fun that they had uh, in, in showing the broadcast was was really pretty cool. I mean, they had Cedric Mullins in, in center field, and they had Austin Hayes in right field, both with uh, microphones and earpieces talking to each other and the booth. You know, they had uh, Ad, Adley Rushman, Hall of Fame, future Hall of Famer, even though he's only played in 40 games. They had him in the dugout like speaking. They had uh, on the kids cast on ESPN2, they were FaceTiming some players. I just thought it was a really unique way to get everybody always talks, Andrew, about how come baseball can't market themselves. I thought that ESPN did a really good job because they got these players to show their personalities and to show sort of how they approach the game. And I just thought I, I thought it was a really neat, uh, uh, neat uh, telecast. Yeah, I mean, and it's probably largely Mark Gross, I think a college graduate, uh, Carl Ravage, lead by play by player. Uh, Lee, you know, Ithaca College graduate, so probably uh, their Ithaca College roots, uh, where the uh, they learned those things at WICB and ICTV. Uh, but yeah, that, that's good. I mean, the Little League, I, I have mixed feelings, quite honestly. About you know, I know it's a big thing, but the leaguers being on national TV, I don't know if that's the best thing personally. I think it probably uh, corrodes, uh, you know, like the expectations and. Uh, youth sports are a total mess, but uh, but you're right. The production it's special for those kids. Don't get me wrong. It's just the not not specific parents, but just overall our youth sports are totally broken in my opinion in America. Um, and so uh, but but this is feel good. Uh, and you're giving credit, so I, I will go. Uh, that, <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to be such a downer. But I feel good. It, it didn't feel good at all, no, right there. Youth sport, I mean, we <laughs> really have twelve year olds. I get it. It's nice. It's just like I just think. Uh, just that the where it starts and people just like manipulating the teams. I just kind of, I don't know if it's, you know, really we, we, we have to have a, uh, a topic on this um, uh, next week. Cause you're right. They're like some of the attitudes in youth sports and especially manipulating the teams, but having been a little league baseball coach myself back when my, my son was uh, what was playing, like yep. you saw bitter tears. You saw the, the tension without t television cameras there anyway. The, the, the added cameras there, they don't add to the tension. The kids feel that themselves. John loves kids crying. Uh, nothing makes them happier. <laughs> See a kid cry uh, when he strikes out. And it's a, uh, no, look, I, I, it's special in a lot of ways. It's great. I love just, it. I think it's great programming. I love all, I love all the little league stuff. Yeah, it is. It's weird. Quite honestly, in my opinion, it, honestly, when you take a step <laughs> back, it's odd. We're watching 12 year olds and like putting like, it's important. And when you look back, I'm all like, whatever, this is a longer conversation. I could do like, I mean, honestly, it's another passion. I love media, but it is a passion. Uh, and even like you heard Monet Davis was on it. Her advice to kids was like, make, keep it as, keep it fun as long as possible. You hear kids say that all the time to me, which is just awful. Like oh, how the heck we've made oh, sports, sports not fun. How have uh, we made sports not fun? Uh, I mean, it's because uh, of these moron coaches and parents, the kids are great, but the, you know, whatever. All right might be passionate about that topic. Well, let's get to the big get, John. All right, I've been looking forward to this all week. Our big get today, Andrew, is Burke Magnus, the pride of Holy Cross, is joining us today. The president of programming at ESPN. This is a true story. My daughter uh, attends Holy Cross. She's a senior there in Worcester, Massachusetts. So I get the alumni magazine and I leaf through it every single month, it seems, or every quarter, there's the story and a picture of Burke Magnus on there. I'm, I'm now competing with the Holy Cross alumni magazine, Burke. I, I, I don't know. I guess there's not a lot of us working in sports, so maybe they think that's cool or it breaks up all the stories about Wall Street guys and stuff like that and, and doctors and lawyers and, and that kind of thing. So well, I, I think, Burke, tell me if I'm wrong, Bill Simmons, Holy Cross. Yeah. Right. Dave Lennon, outstanding columnist, baseball columnist for Newsday, Holy Cross. So they got they got 
That's not a bad trifecta to start it, off with. That's a pretty good yeah. big three right there. Dave Anderson and his son, uh, Steve Anderson, for, formerly of Holy, uh, formerly of ESPN. So pretty good. And, you know, there's a few of us. There's a few of us. All right. So so uh, continue the uh, the intro. Burke has been with ESPN 26 years, starting off as a program associate, and now you're running all programming and content. It's like a Bodenheimer story, starting off in the mailroom uh, almost. I, jo I joke with George all the time because that's the only thing I didn't do was pick up Dickie V at the airport. You know, that was <laughs> that's my claim to fame. But I, I got to know Burke about 15 years ago when he ran the college sports uh, at ESPN, oversaw the creation of SEC Network, Longhorn Network, ACC Network, cut all these deals with just about every single college conference. So we're excited to have you on, uh, particularly now given you know, the Big Ten deal and all the movement in college sports. The big story, of course, has been ESPN is not going to be in business with the, the, the Big Ten. Uh, yeah. but, but of course, you're not getting out of college sports. You have the ACC, SEC going into the 2030s. So I, I'm going to start off with the softball. Marchand asked the tough questions here. Yeah. All right, why are college sports so important to ESPN? That, that is a good, it's a great question, actually. I mean, it, it, it has been a tentpole since the very beginning, um, you know, at the time, 40 plus years ago, it was really the best stuff that was available, right? I mean, it, the, the pro, pro leagues were everything. We couldn't, ESPN couldn't really get their hands on a meaningful uh, pro sports contract for, for several years at the beginning, um, you know, for, for various reasons, but, but mostly because it was an emerging industry. Cable television was new, reach was limited, you know, um, we were unproven. Um, so college was available. And so we, we leaned heavily into college and pretty consistently since that time, we've just grown our portfolio and grown our involvement because we also realized that it was um, what I refer to as regional at its core, but national in its interest, right? And so we, you know, we have since I've been at ESPN, which goes back to 95, you know, done nothing but continue to grow, you know, our activity in college sports because of the passionate fans, because of, you know, the diversity of the content, because you can uh, have regional appeal um, to help drive subscriptions, both in a MVPD sense, but digital sense or direct to consumer sense. So it's always been just, you know, absolute, you know, table stakes for us in terms of our content offering. That's what makes what, what happened with the Big Ten so surprising or such a big uh, news story. The, your relationship with the Big Ten, ESPN's relationship predates you. It started in 1982. I think ABC had a game, uh, game starting in 1966. Like, what happened there, Burke? Yeah, 1966, same year I was born. So, uh, and then uh, and then 82, let's see, I was a sophomore at uh, Bergen Catholic High School in New Jersey. So yes, it does predate me, but I think that is, you know, the, the, the length of the, of the relationship and the depth of the relationship um, really underscores how difficult uh, a decision this was for us. Um, you know, the big 10 is absolutely, you know, paramount in, in, in the college conference landscape. It's great brands. I mean, you, you know, them, so I won't, I won't list laundry list them, but you know, it, it, it was something that, that, that we did not take lightly. We knew it was going to be difficult. We knew the competition was going to be stiff for it, but we kind of, you know, we said to ourselves, listen, we, here's what we're hoping to get out of a continued relationship with the big 10. And, you know, what we needed to get at the price that we needed to get it at, neither of those things were available to us. And so, you know, as difficult as it was to go separate directions, um, you know, it was the right decision for our company. There's no doubt about that. We're going to continue to be heavily invested in college sports. Nothing is forever in the rights buying business. So you got to be somewhat dispassionate about and stick to your process, if you will. Um, but it was hard. It was a hard decision, uh, but I think it was the right decision for us, mostly because of what was available, being, or what was on offer to us to, to buy, uh, which was not what we were hoping for. So, Burke, when you break down to what, you know, 
John has been, you know, at, on top of this. Um, I've had some stories too, but John's been really at the most on top of this. Um, there was a report that you could have maybe had a deal for $380 million. The SEC is, you're paying around $300 million. So the question I had for you is two things. Number one, when you look at that, right, this is the, the SEC, you're getting the premier game every week, that CBS package, which, you know, we, we know how um, great those games should be. Uh, with the package you're going to go for, that afternoon package, it's not as clear, you know, especially weekly, how good those games will be every week. Did you feel like we're spending $300 million on the SEC for their top games? How can we go to the Big Ten and give them 380 um, that's my first question. How much of a factor was you already have the SEC at this price and then the big 10, you're going to, if you'd done the deal, it's you would have paid a lot more for it. Um, give me your thoughts on that, please. Yeah, it, it wasn't really price relativity to the SEC, but having all of the SEC was actually, you know, a great, you know, a, a place of, of security for us. We knew no matter what, as a matter of fact, we, you know, we're going to, you know, our sh right now we have by far and away the biggest share of audience in college football, like all, over 50 percent of total viewership in the sales demo, 18 to 49, comes through the Disney networks. Um, we will take a dip in that number in 2023 because the SEC deal that we bought, the SEC rights that we bought, which was the CBS package, has, haven't started yet. And the Big Ten will be gone after this year. So we'll take a one year dip in our share. But actually coming out of that, when the SEC rights flow in in 2024 and then Texas and Oklahoma come in 2025, our share of college football viewership will actually grow without the Big Ten, um, without the Big Ten with, in the way it was being offered to us, in other words. Right. And what I mean by that is um, right now we split the Big Ten rights with Fox. Essentially, it's an even split with two big differences. Right. Fox has the number one pick overall, so they start the draft every year at number one. That's typically been o Ohio State, Michigan. We would do the very same thing if we were them. Uh, they paid for that right, and then they had the football championship every every year. Um, other than that, it was an even split of of quality uh, and quantity, uh, for that matter. And you know what was what what happened here was we were being offered half the number of games we currently have, lower selection priorities, and essentially double the price. And so it really came down to what the component parts of were of the, of the Big Ten deal on offer. Uh, and knowing that we had you know, the SEC already in the house, the ACC already in the house, by the way, two more years of Pac-12, three more years of Big 12, the CFP for four more years, like, and, and, you know, and, and a different path to use our financial resources if, we, if we're not going the Big Ten route, you know, in terms of renewing Pac-12, Big 12, CFP expansion is looming. We have an NCAA championships uh, agreement that's very, very important to us. Like there's a bunch of stuff that we would want to do that we would have been uh, very, sort of constrained financially from doing if we were to do the Big Ten. So that's kind of the way the calculus was. The SEC, we never looked at it from an SEC Big Ten perspective other than to say, boy, don't, let, let's not forget that we have a decade of a 16 team SEC, 100% of that coming in, you know, in 2024. So that's a, that's a nice security blanket for sure. Now, you know, what we cover has been a big part of this college TV, you know, movement. So when you heard about UCLA and USC moving to the Big Ten, two questions for you here. Uh, my first one, what was your reaction? And I'm just going to follow up um, with my second one. Yeah, I think like most people, I was I was stunned, um, you know, um, not because I didn't understand the logic between behind that decision for, for those institutions, but more like it, it kind of harkens back to something I said a little bit earlier, which is. For me, college sports has always been at its essence, a regional proposition, right? The Big Ten is the Midwest. You know, the outset, the SEC is the Southeast, along with the ACC. The Big 12 is the Southwest, and so on and so forth. The Pac-12, obviously, is the West Coast. And so this was the first move in the real, in the very, and I, by the way, I've seen just about every iteration of the realignment era over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, uh, 20 years, uh, you know, I've, I've had a front row seat. Um, 
But this was the first one where I felt like geography as a consideration was not was not there, right? I mean, e even as 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 uh, you know as as significant and as stunning sort of Texas and Oklahoma moving to the SEC was only a little more than a year ago, um, you know, the SEC already had a school in Texas, in Texas A and M. Oklahoma is contiguous to Texas, like so it made sense. It was geography spreading, but it wasn't geography disassociated with the rest of the league. And that was the part that I had a real hard time coming to, to, to grips with. But, you know, ch change is a constant in this in this world. And and, you know, you know, uh, like I said, I think the, the underlying reasons for those institutions to, to consider it and ultimately do it are obvious to me. Um, I had a, my son went to USC, so. He's, he lives in New York, so he's really excited that he'll be able to see USC come come east uh, on occasion. But um, big USC Rutgers uh, matchup yeah. that'll be a that'll be yeah. good. Yeah, Huge. but you know what I mean. Like that's that's what that was the shocking part to me was just this 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 notion that uh, that West Coast Los Angeles, not just West mm -hmm. Coast Los Angeles based schools, were going to be in this conference that to me really just screams Midwest. That's their brand, you know. So now from a TV executive perspective when you look at colleges you talked about texas and oklahoma who are going to move to the sec now we have ucla and usc going to the big 10 how do you guys look what what is your criteria do you look at these um institutions and say they're worth this much to us tv wise and if you add those teams to your league it's worth this much and can you get what's the perspective of what that means um and, and how you look at it how do you look at it from a tv perspective well, first of all, very important nuance here because this often gets mischaracterized, uh, certainly about us, um, is that 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 the analysis you're talking, the kind of analysis you're talking about, we don't get involved until it's all until it happens, right? I mean, so if Conference X comes to us and says, "Hey, we, we uh, we've extended invitations to these two institutions," there are there are in every contract we have usually very specific provisions about how a negotiation would then commence, uh, but it's after the fact, right? It's not before. We don't sit there ever and get involved in, in you know, hey, you should, guys, you, you should do this school instead of that school, and here's why. But downstream, it's our job uh, to, to assess uh, market value for, for institutions that are coming and those provisions are, have been have been specifically constructed in the rights agreement um, for a long time now. Um, it used to be more of a um, you know more of an open ended process. Um, in some contracts, it's a specific number. You've heard the phrase pro rata, meaning like whoever comes in, regardless of who it is, gets a share uh, equal to a per institution share that the others get. Um, so sometimes it's actually prescribed. Sometimes it's a negotiation. Um, sometimes it's both, right? Sometimes it's, hey, the baseline is a pro rata and we go from there, uh, depending on who it is. So, um, but, you know, very important, um, you know, and I know uh, people out there suspect, you know, are looking for smoking guns and suspect, you know, involvement on the front end. But trust me when I tell you my day is full enough. You know, I, I don't, <laughs> no, nobody sits You're around. You're not the one ruining college football? No, no. Those, those, no. Those, are true. Yeah. those are true. Okay. So I want to stick with the, the Big Ten real, uh, real quick. The, there's been uh, press reports suggesting that there still could be a package that ESPN uh, could end up taking with the, the Big Ten. Uh, are you talking to the Big Ten? Is, is it, there such a deal out there? Nothing active at the moment, John. I mean, I guess I think you could say that about any, you know, circumstance out there. You know, like obviously, if the Big Ten was gonna was gonna call us with, I'm not sure what they would offer at this point. We have a really good relationship with Com Commissioner Warren. We obviously know all you know all the athletic directors. I mean, we've been their partner for decades, as you noted. So, um, you know, if the phone rang, we you know we we would pick it up. But at this point. Uh, there's no active conversation, and I'm not sure, you know, based on, again, what we were hoping to get out of a deal in the first place is really not available, so I'm not sure what what that would look like. One of the stories that I'm fascinated by is in two years, when you get the, when you get the SEC, 
and all of a sudden you're going to be you're, you're going to have all of the SEC and you're going to have all of the ACC and I'm going to try to get you to tap into your programming uh, brain that you that you used to work on all the time. Yeah. How do you program that? Are you are you going to be counter programming or uh, like how do you move forward in terms of figuring out which games to put where? Let me start with the SEC because I think it's it's a little easier to explain because there's this existing um, cadence to SEC football that has existed for a long time. You know, one of the core provisions in when we acquired the CBS package was that we would commit to the SEC to continue to program 330 on ABC with an SEC game. So we will do that every week, each and every week. The beauty of that, um, and the reason we were so excited about, you know, putting in what I called at the time the missing piece, was that all of the other considerations are really constraints to how we programmed SEC football that were purely a factor of CBS having that piece as opposed to us, all that melts away, right? So there's no draft anymore. It's not first pick has to go here or, or there's a limit to how many games we could put in prime time. We can't currently put games on ABC, for example. We have, this is like one of the last remaining cable broadcast package dynamics, right? So every game that's available on the slate for a particular week can be programmed anywhere um, with the only constraints really being certain start time provisions. You know, the SEC obviously likes to play. They prefer prime time instead of afternoon you know, they have heat issues early in the year. So noon starts are sometimes need to be managed, et cetera. But that's just, that's normal stuff. What, what we're most excited about is, you know, we can now put, I mean, by the way, we could go three wide on ABC, you know, with noon, 3.30 and primetime, all SEC if we wanted to. And we intend to compete, you know, um, without hesitation uh, against, you know, every other, like we do now. I mean, the, the, here's what you may not understand about, about being out of the Big Ten businesses. We don't lose a single window of college football. We will not reduce what we're doing by one game. So every week is still going to be three windows on ABC, three, sometimes four windows on, on ESPN, same on ESPN2, ESPNU, the SEC network, the ACC network, our digital and direct to consumer games. So um, we're, we're going to, we're, we're obviously going to lean into our best available product and compete uh, favorably. I think the big difference you will see is that there will be more SEC, more top quality SEC games in prime time specifically. Burke, I, I like to say, what am I saying? I like to say everyone loves sports media. Um, I think college football fans though, have learned to really love it even more. So you know, we have a lot of people who have, uh, relatively maybe new to the podcast from different parts of the country. So I just want to kind of go around a little bit and tell us what you can tell us in terms of where we stand with these other conferences and what could possibly happen. Um, so let's just first start with the big 12 and where do you stand with that and where do you see it going? Well, I think the big 12 and the PAC 12 for us are in similar circumstances, right? Which is they both um, expire relatively soon. Uh, two years in the case of the big, the Pac-12, three years in the case of the Big 12. Um, you know, like we like when we looked at the Big Ten again, we had sort of two two paths we could have chosen. Right, one was to use essentially all of our re financial resources to stay in the Big Ten business, uh, or you know, take that same amount of of available money and lean into you know, a variety of different things, including those two conferences, like I said, including the, you know, I, I presume the college football playoffs going to expand ultimately, eventually, you know, our NCAA championships deal. We just announced the women's tournament on ABC. You got to get a plug in for that today. We just announced that this morning. So like, that's a really important deal to, uh, for us as well. So, you know, so first up from a power five conference perspective is, the Pac-12 and with the Big 12 really sort of in a you know a fairly similar time frame in terms of renewal extension. Um, the Big 12, you know, has been through their membership changes. There might be more, who knows? 
Um, but they obviously, in the wake of Texas and Oklahoma, brought in four schools to replace the, those two, ultimately, when, when they come over to the SEC. Um, and then the Pac-12 now with 10 members is, you know, is, is trying to stabilize themselves and also look at what the future might look like from a membership perspective as well. So I think you'll see us, you know, and, and by the way, both of those current partners of ours, we share both with Fox um, and, you know, and I think we're very interested in, in both of them going forward uh, in the short term. And so, look, we talked earlier about how you guys, the, how you factor into alignment and you know realignment and all that type of stuff. But when you're doing these deals, like right now, are you able to do a deal or do you have to wait to see what the conferences look at? Like, what are we looking at a timetable in, in terms of that factor? Because, you know, all these people at all these universities, all these fans out there, they're wondering, you know, when are they going to know what conference their team's going to be in the future, their, their yeah. university? Um, how does that work? Do they say, well, how about if we do this? You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I know you say you guys aren't involved, but, yeah. you, but I do think it is a factor, right? Like, obviously, the Pac-12 is different without UCLA and USC. If they lose somebody else or if they gain somebody else, it's a different TV economics. You know, it's a moment in time, right? Right now, the Pac-12 is a 10-team league. We can absolutely do a deal for their current membership. Um, we like their current membership. I mean, those are all, we have a deal with them now that, that other than removing USC and UCLA, and I don't mean to minimize that because it, it, it was, those are big brands in that, in that conference. Those are all great institutions that remain um, that, that play high caliber uh, intercollegiate sports, both not just football, but men's and women's basketball, Olympic sports, the conference of champions for a reason. Like they've won more national championships in every sport. Hey, Park, are they still the really? conference of champions without those two? Well, I don't know. You'd have to like you know, take the totals uh, and, and figure yeah. that out. Right. But but you know what I'm saying? Like those are those are really good. Those are really good uh, 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 institutions that compete at the highest level of, of intercollegiate athletics. So we the way we're looking at it is we, we can do a deal for the membership as it currently exists. The provisions for membership change are, like I said, are fairly standard in terms of how you how we protect our interests and also provide a mechanism to uh, to account for future changes. And the same goes for the Big 12. Um, um, you know, like I said, I think the Big 12, it, it, you know, in a way, having already brought in, you know, the four schools to replace Texas and Oklahoma, you know, is a little bit more or a little bit further ahead in terms of the membership, you know, uh, construct of it all. Um, I don't think anybody believes the Pac-12 will stay at 10 necessarily, but we don't need to know anything beyond these are the 10, these are the rights, here's a value. And then, you know, there'll be a mechanism to account for, for any new members if, if, if that is to happen. Okay, now the internet makes it so anybody who has a theory can put it on the internet, especially if they have a following, it can gain some steam. So nobody I have a question. Here, nobody here, right? I mean- No, no, I don't think, we try our best. <laughs> Pressing company a, accepted. <laughs> every once in a while, we'll get a call from the head of uh, PR, Chris LaPlock, and be like, what about this? But uh, usually he's wrong. Um, so uh, here's my question about the ACC. Can you explain to me, uh, and I understand that, but I think it's better to hear from you, in terms of the ACC's deal, and are there any mechanisms for that to change in terms of what that ACC deal is and how it relates to the ACC network? Because I know there's theories out there that they could just like break up. And from what I understand, especially with, again, it's hard to see because you guys have so many networks, like what the ACC, it seems like that's pretty successful in terms of like what yeah. you're doing with that. And so it doesn't seem like it's just like, eh, let's just break that up. Like there's, there's contracts involved. And so can you just tell us uh, the ACC network and, you know, for people who are, you know, wondering about where that conference is and where it's going, how you guys look at that? Yeah, I mean, J John's uh, publication covered it pretty well in the in the recent article about Commissioner Swafford as one of their champions this year, um, and the reasons why their current circuit, how we got to where we are today, right? And and by the way, like not to toot our own horn here, but like we we launched you know um, a new linear network in the face of an industry going in the opposite direction. So talk about headwinds and got it fully distributed in only a couple of years time 
um, that services those institutions very, very well and created incredible financial um, consideration for the conference out of out of content that was being used, you know, in a different form uh, previously in all in all old sort of over the air syndication deals and stuff like that. So it's been a tremendous success and services the, the schools um, and provides revenue for those institutions, you know, that didn't exist only a couple years ago. Um, you know, the trade off for that was to extend our deal long term, uh, for which that the, the conference, you know, um, you know, went in into that circumstance very, very willingly. I mean, the, the network business, as you guys, I think, can fully, fully know and appreciate is you're not going to do something like launch a new linear network without, you know, enough time, you know, to, 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 to realize a significant return on investment. It's an incredible amount of, of upfront money that has to be has to be dedicated. You've got to hire a bunch of people, hundreds of people. You've got to, you know, you've got to really put your shoulder behind distribution and sales and production and everything. So it's literally like starting a new company, and you're not going to do that for a five-year horizon. You know, you're going to do that for a twenty-year horizon, and uh, and really that's where. Um, they find themselves right now, which by the way, like in the grand scheme of what you read, again, if you happen to visit the internet from time to time and see theories about what might, yeah, might make that's what I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to get at those uh, yeah. theories and where the it, mechanisms. It, it actually provides them in, in the, in this world right now of realignment that seems relatively unpredictable. It actually provides them some degree of security and uh, you know, that, that I, I think, you know, some of their peer conferences might, you know, might be envious of, you know, and protection in terms of, you know, their membership, their rights, um, the, their revenue certainty over time. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's the current situation going forward. Like, you know, we have a really, we have every incentive in, in the world um, to, to get creative with the ACC to continue to try and unearth new incremental value that will benefit their members in terms of, you know, the, the financial uh, picture of the conference long-term. And for what type of things, like what could, like, give me an example of like what that could be. There's all kinds of things. I mean, you, you know, like you, you read recently coming out of, I think it was one of their AD meetings that the SEC is considering playing nine conference games, right. In football, like that's a perfect example of something in that league that could in fact create great value from a media perspective, because you're replacing, you know, games, you know, bad non-conference games or cupcake games with SEC versus SEC. You know, anytime two of those schools are getting together, it's worth more than, you know, them playing, you know, somebody random or, or inconsequential. So, like, that's a perfect example of the kinds of things, whether that's football. The, AC, the beauty of the ACC is their, their men's basketball and their women's basketball profile is so far beyond all of their peer conferences when you consider Duke, North Carolina, Syracuse, Louisville, et cetera, and on and on and on. So men's basketball and women's basketball is incredibly meaningful and they're scheduling things that could be done there that create new value. They probably are the modern day or at least the East Coast version of the Pac-12 from a women's sports and Olympic sports perspective in terms of winning national championships um, and competing at the highest level and things like soccer, lacrosse, volleyball, uh, field hockey, et cetera. So you mentioned more value in college basketball and obviously yeah. you have like Duke, North Carolina rivalries. I mean, and I, I would, I don't know offhand, but I believe those are probably the highest rated games. Is there a oh, way yeah. that maybe they, they play more often during the regular season? Is that yeah. something that could be created? Listen, I, I don't think anything's off the, the cons off the table from a consideration perspective. Right. I mean, um, you know, like sometimes college sports tends to trap itself, you know, in its own tradition. Right. And by the way, tradition is what we also love about college sports, though. So you can't throw everything out the window. But that's 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 a perfect example of something where if you innovate around, you know, around your most valuable assets, maybe maybe there's a way to sort of get both things accomplished. Right. And so, you know, all of that's on the table. The ACC operates from a position of strength as far as I'm concerned. We built this incredible business together in the ACC network, which is only going to continue to get more valuable. Um, you know, 
So we, we feel good about that situation, but that is with, through the lens of trying, working with them to try and create more value and make them as stable as they can possibly be. SEC network, ACC network, they're relatively stable, as stable as a uh, linear cable channel are, are these right. days. Right. Um, Texas going to the SEC, what's, what's happening with the uh, Longhorn network? Yeah, I think, listen, ultimately that will be folded into the SEC network. All that content that, you know, that you find on the Longhorn network is the, you know, sometimes called third tier, sometimes called institutional. Um, it is the it is the content that would, uh, like any other SEC institution, be expressed through the SEC network. So, you know, what we don't know there is the precise timing on on Texas and Oklahoma. Obviously, if they run their course, which we're perfectly fine with, it's 2025. You know, if it's something, if it's something before that, that might, that has to change your timing on, on, on that process as well. But, but at its, at its essence, that, that those two things come together. Burke, you've been, you know, up, I, I believe at least your name's been mentioned with some of these conferences in terms of leading them um, before my question for you, if you were on the other side of things, if you were a commissioner right now, what would you be trying to do? One of these like conferences, if you're the, you know, who, who don't have TV deals already, what would you be trying to do? We're asking you to take the role of a consultant, Bert. <laughs> I think I'm more likely to be a consultant than a commissioner, but I'm, I'm more <laughs> likely. really? You got Wild Act, all those guys, all your yeah. brethren, they go there. Well, for, for, for anybody who happens to be listening from ESPN or the Walt Disney Company, I love my job. <laughs> I, have one of the, I have one of the great jobs well, in the business. Well, Yes, but I mean, you want to be sought after. I mean, they don't want Disney doesn't want a bunch of executives that nobody wants. So I mean, I think it's a compliment. And we don't. Yeah. I didn't say where. You know, I, I you know yeah. back twelve. Um, the um. So Burke, the question though is, but if you're from you, you, yeah. you know the TV perspective, you obviously are very familiar. And my my point was really not to yeah. put you on the spot and make you uncomfortable, although that was a plus. Um, my real point was to um, to understand you understand this perspective. I mean, you're the type yeah. of profile that these you know they, they don't they didn't all do this they haven't all of the conferences haven't gone with the xtv exec but it it has been the trend over the last you know 10 15 20 years um so if you are running one of these conferences what would you be doing i would be focused on a couple things one one would be um you know stabilizing membership generally is is important um making sure that everybody sitting around the table has a shared purpose um you know, I think everybody's circumstance is a little bit different. So while the Pac-12 may clearly be looking at trying to replace UCLA and USC, maybe the Big 12 is happy with their membership. So it's not about a realignment or an or a, or a uh, or or acquiring uh, a mem new membership um, necessarily. But um, it, you know, in addition to you know to market size. Uh, traditions and rivalry. The great thing about everybody talks about market size, like the amount of time we spend thinking about market size, it pales in comparison to the amount of time we think about rivalries, right? I mean, what market size does Alabama have, right? Mm, yep. You know, what, what, what market size does Oklahoma have for that matter, right? But like in college sports, it's the rivalries, it's the traditions, it's the brands that really aggregate audience. So I'd be thinking about innovating around, you know, your strongest assets. Like we were talking about with Duke and, and Carolina. I think that's an interesting idea. I hadn't even thought of, but I, I may be stealing from you, Andrew, but All right, great. Um, I'll take a consultant fee. Yeah, but I would absolutely be leaning into um, college football playoff expansion. That, that seems to be not only what fans want, I, I mean, I was stunned, frankly, that the 12 thing didn't happen because it was so well thought out. It was not, you know, any one person's idea. It was a subcommittee of the commissioners that came up with it with varying interests, big conferences, small conferences, or mid-level conferences. At Jack Swarbrick was part of it with Notre Dame, the only independent. Um, like that, that to me feels like it's, it's absolutely time for the next step, the next iteration of the college football playoff. And by the way, a lot of revenue comes with that from a TV perspective. So that would help everybody in the whole enterprise. I'd be thinking about, you know, you know, the next iteration of what the men's basketball tournament might be, might look like as good as that is, I think it could be even better. Um, I think the time to monetize women's sports 
in a in a much more significant way is right around the corner, if not here already. Um, and then I'd be thinking about how to engage the corporate community even deeper at a quasi national level, as opposed to more local and regional. I think sales and sponsorship of the conference level still tends to be more regional in nature than it is national brands. And I think national brands may be missing the boat on that, which is another big revenue uh, uh, source. So it's a combination of a bunch of things, but listen, college sports, obviously by what happened in the big 10 is still an incredibly healthy proposition, um, you know, from a, from a, from a TV and media perspective. And Oh, by the way, NIL, which is going to have to be you know, sifted through and straightened out eventually. It feels like it's, you know, could get messier before it gets better. But, uh, but ultimately, I think it's the right idea for, you know, for student athletes to be able to share in some of the commercial aspects of intercollegiate athletics. I think, you know, you can't, on the one hand, be doing a billion dollar television deal. And then on the other hand, you know, suggesting that, you know, that, that it's, you know, that, that it's not a commercial enterprise. Right. Um, so um, the truth obviously is somewhere, you know, in the middle of that dynamic. So it's a, it's a variety of different things, but it's a very healthy proposition from a media perspective as demonstrated by the interest in not just the big 10, but what's to follow. Hey Burke, I don't think we have blocked off enough time for you. I think this could go on for, for 90 minutes, at least double the time. I, I have uh, just one more question though. You know, sure. You've been doing this for a long time. You, you've referenced a couple of times that you know you've seen realignment happen before, and you've you, you've you've. Uh, but this feels different to me. Does it feel different to you? Is this is this different, or is this just, just uh, sort of more of the same? I think only time will tell on that one, John. Um, it it like I said, I it felt it feels different. It felt different the moment I first heard it, for sure. Um, I think a year from now, or or maybe even two years from now, um, I think that we'll be able to better answer that question um, because I think what everybody doesn't know is really what's to come, uh, you know, downstream, you know, from from the from the USC and UCLA move. Um, but um, but I don't know. At its essence, it, it did. Like I said, it felt different to me you know, at the moment, mostly because of the geography element of it. Um, but we'll, we'll see, you know, like, do you feel like we're on the, on the road to two major college conferences and a bunch of other conferences? No, no, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think there's separation between the big 10 and the sec, which, which, which is obvious, you know, by, by that single sort of measuring stick of how much media money they're going to be able to, to drive. Um, but, but no, I, I don't. I don't think so. I, I think, you know, the the power conferences as we know them are going to continue to thrive. Um, college sports is going to continue to thrive, um, and we shouldn't. I don't think. I think it would be short sighted to look at it purely through that prism. Um, but because um, that 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 part of it, I think, will be just fine for the long the long haul. Burke, I just want to understand. This is kind of more of a broader question. You know, ESPN has been. You know, it became ESPN because of, you know, figuring out and monetizing distribution better than anybody. And, and you know, they, from cable, even the internet with ESPN.com, they're first into their radio a little late, but um, and not as important, but, but still you're into ESPN radio. And now you're going to streaming um, and you just went on a shopping spree. You know, I think I, I forgot what I wrote. I think 40 billion or something overall um, where you have competition from Amazon, you have competition from Apple, um, but you've kind of made a moat. You know, people act as if, uh, you know, and, you know, Fox as well has a lot of stuff, CBS, NBC, too, and Turner. Uh, but but you guys have the most. Um, just can you give me an overview of terms of what your philosophy has been and what you've just done? Um, you know, now the NBA is on the horizon and the other college yeah. deals, but, but you've done a lot of deals and Amazon and Apple, a lot of people are pointing, they're going to get this, they're going to get that, but there's not that much to get. So I mean, yeah. can you give us your philosophy and, and also just did those digital players, did, how much did they factor into your thinking? Really going back to early 2020, sort of late 2019, um, is we made a priority list for acquisitions that we then executed against for the last 18, 24 months, right? And that's everything that you that you just referenced, which is 
Monday Night Football and the NFL, a new NFL deal, NHL acquisition, extension with MLB, the CBS SEC package, Wimbledon, Aussie Open, PGA Tour Live in La Liga for ESPN Plus, Formula One just this past year. So we've decided sort of like what we think is going to move our business ahead across platform. And we've, that's where, that's what we pursued and that's what we got. Um, you know, um, the big 10 was, was difficult in that regard. Like I said, because I, you know, we, we would have loved to, to have stayed in, but we, we stayed disciplined to our process. We stayed to sort of true to what we thought was going to move our business and what terms were necessary to do that. Um, but you know, like we, we, in an era where you cannot possibly own it all, you have to set your priorities. You have to decide what, what, what you want to get and, and try and get that. Um, you know, you mentioned the, you mentioned the, uh, you know, the, 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 the landscape of digital players, by the way, I, I enjoy, you know, the, the ongoing debate between you and John in terms of, I, I still can't tell who's going to win this argument or actually who's winning at any moment in time, but, um, but who's but, winning it right now, Burke, is what we want to know. This is the argument of when ESPN, the mothership, will go direct to consumer, also being on cable. Right. I said, now we're about four years away, less, four or less years away. Uh, we had Michael Nathanson last week, uh, who was an expert on this. He had it basically around that time. So, Burke, why don't you just tell us when it's going to be? <laughs> well, <laughs> I can't do that. Um, uh, uh, I can't do that, but uh, I'll let Jimmy do that when, when, when the right. time comes. <laughs> But uh, I don't know. Listen, like we're, we're, we're the other thing we're trying to stay stay true to is, you know, you've heard Jimmy talk about it is running these parallel paths in in a era of uh, a transforming business. Right. You know, you read a lot about ESPN subscriptions um, are, are are where we're losing subscription. Like they write, you know, like people write about ESPN as if it's only ESPN losing subscribers. Like what's happening is the multi channel business is transforming right and so cable and satellites and telco subscriptions as a whole are dwindling not just espn subscriptions right so what we decided a while back and you know and you've heard us say it before is we're going to run these parallel paths where we have a very good business on the multi-channel you know it's declining obviously but it's a very healthy and good profitable business and we're going to make sure that we create you know a lane in the streaming space for sports that's espn branded that is going to be able to have, you know, so we're going to be able to have optionality for fans wherever they are, right? Our, our mission is to serve sports fans anytime, anywhere, not anytime on cable TV, you know? So we have, you know, we have ABC, the broadcast network. We have all of our cable networks. We have all of our digital and social. And by the way, our digital and social are up incredibly um, in terms of usage year over year. Our linear ratings in, on cable are up double digits for the year. Um, so, um, you know, our content on ABC, the big reach platform of the broadcast network is absolutely critical in today's world. And then direct to consumer, which gives us the opportunity to bid on rights and make acquisitions that we frankly wouldn't have been able to do in a purely linear world. You know, all of that together. And if you stay disciplined to your financial plan, um, you know, we think we have the best hand. And so we're going to continue to do that. Uh, and the competition comes in in many shapes and sizes, and it's as competitive as it's ever been. Um, you know, you guys hear everything, so you know, like who's in on what negotiation. You know, uh, you know that the streamers have have taken runs at major properties. They're going to get things. Um, it's a little bit like the broadcast and cable dynamic of years ago, where I think rights holders really want sort of there to be a proof of concept be, before they sell something you know that that's that's i would categorize as as truly meaningful exclusively to a streamer um little dribs and drabs will 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 happen you know the peacock portion of the big 10 you know um you know being an example of that if that goes well then that might bode better for streamers so i think it's you know it's an evolution things are gonna uh, are gonna come and go um we're, we're happy with the with the portfolio we have we have our eye on a few more things that are coming. NBA, you know, we, we have an unbelievable relationship with that league. It's an ascendant sport globally. Um, it's absolutely critical to our business. And we're going to, we're going to, 
compete really hard to, 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 to remain their partner. And just to be clear on all these deals you've done, you have the option to be on cable and then go direct to consumer for all the live properties that you now, um, you know, with these new deals or all your deals, basically. Is that, is that accurate? Yes. Yes. John, that's, that's a plus for me. Yeah. But did you hear it? Listen to his answer. He agrees with me. He's totally on TV. Yeah. But again, like, yeah, by the way, the other thing, not you guys, yeah, you guys don't do this, but the other, the other thing that you read from time to time is people write like, you're just going to wake up one day and ca- there's no cable television. Like it's no. like a, like it's an on off switch. You know what I mean? Like, no, it's these, the par- par- Jimmy said it best. It's the parallel paths where re- it's like, they're both going, you know, you've got to be able to put content seamlessly between them. You've got to offer content to fans where they live. You know, a lot of people live outside the system right now. So you've got to, you've got to address that. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's never going to be one thing or the other. It's going to be, uh, you know, like I said, an evolution over time. And, and that's that we, we, we want to be prepared regardless of what the outcome is. Burke, you said you had your eyes on other, thing, other things. What's an up and coming sport that you have your eye on that's, uh, that's going to be big? Well, it's, it's no secret I'm a, I'm a lacrosse aficionado, right? So our, we're off to a really good start with the PLL uh, on, that, on that deal. Uh, we're, we're thrilled about that. It's, we're trying again to connect a meaningful college sport with the professional league and, and, and carry a sport through all phases, um, you know, of competition. Um, you know, it, it is, uh, I think a perfect combination of like, you know, a physical field sport, uh, with high scoring. Um, and you know, John, you live right in one of the hotbeds, so you know how national champions, Yeah, it, it competes favorably, against you know some more traditional sports in a lot of areas of the country that have also happened that time of the year so that's something where i you know we really and by the way we we have people now and partners now in the, in the rabel brothers who i think are really special um you know visionary type leaders who can take a sport that absent of this force of personality you know might not be able to get to the heights, it's, I think that these two guys can take it. Great, Burke. I mean, this was excellent. Um, we really appreciate it. You uh, have been in the center of all this uh, college football movement and, and all these moves. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, we, we do who's up, who's down. Uh, a lot of times, you know, the places I like, I, like, I don't really believe in half measures. And I feel like ESPN's not doing a half measure. I feel like Fox is not doing half measure. Not that CBS and NBC, I think they've done some really good things as well. Turner, I don't know what the heck they're doing, but um, the uh, but you guys seem to be ascending. It's very, it's gonna be very interesting to see where this uh, next stage goes, especially in college football. So we really appreciate. It. We know you're very busy taking the time to to be with us. I appreciate it. Thank you guys, and uh, you know maybe I'll make uh, who's up one of these days again, uh, John. I John, John's, had, John's had me as who's down a few times too. So oh, I just, that is true. I'm, who's down is is an even bigger honor than who's up. <laughs> that's, what I'll, I'll, that's, me, that's good job i that. love that yeah keep telling there's me there's no that. bigger honor than being dissed and saying who's down you're right that's good i like that john i'm gonna use that thanks yeah. burke thank you burke right. see you guys andrew uh that was really fabulous uh, uh, th- thank you to burke for coming uh we're already so long so i'm just going to jump into my big takeaway from that big 12 pack 12 expect espn knocking on your door that's my takeaway from that a hundred percent. Um, you know, I, I thought that there's a lot, the, the biggest thing I took away from it is that next week, I think we're going to make Burke Magnus the who's down because you said there's nothing, there's no greater compliment to somebody. It's an honor. That, it's an honor. <laughs> it's a good one. Um, look, I, yeah, he, he was excellent. I thought, you know, look, I, I learned a lot. Hopefully um, it was good for college football fans to understand where everything's going. Um, he said, hands are clean in terms of, you know, you know, in terms of all these moves uh, that have been made. Uh, but uh, but it's going to be interesting to see what's next. And, you know, Kevin Warren's already said that he wants to go to 20 teams. And it's going to be interesting to see if, like, can you add value when you do that? Um, because, you know, like you said earlier, Notre Dame's the only one uh, that really has an assigned value to it. So if you add teams, you know, would each university get less money? And is that really what they want? That, it will be interesting to see how that all plays itself out. All right, John, let's move to call of the week. Call of the week. 
Earlier, John, we had Chris Russo uh, doing a, well, it wasn't really an What's impersonation. <laughs> He's trying to say your name, John Arrand. Oh, good buddy there, John Arrad. So, yeah, so that's that's Chris Russo. Keyshawn Johnson on ESPN did an impersonation that they played on first take of Chris Russo. Let's listen to Keyshawn. There's no way I would draft LeBron James. Why would I ever take LeBron James? Why would I do that? Well, the one thing they got to do is they got the bats. They got to hit the bats. You can't score any runs. How are you going to win any games? It's not the pitching. No, it's not the pitching and the bats. They can't. How, how do you expect Aaron Judge to just lead the team all the way? You can't do it. You can't just win with him. If you had bet me before that a- a- imitation that he would have had a good Russo, I, I would have lost a million dollars. Like, <laughs> good on Keyshawn. That was really good. Yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, was it the best uh, It was Russo? better than yours, Andrew. That's not a high bar, right? <laughs> Keyshawn is a professional radio host on ESPN Radio. His impersonation of Chris Russo should be. But it look, no, look, I, I love it. I appreciate Keyshawn doing that. You know, given, you know, he was the number one pick out of USC. It was, you know, in the, you know, he's into the media. I, I love that. I love like the professional athletes are into the media. Um, and it was good nature too. You know, a lot of the, uh, you know, Russo has been a sensation on ESPN, but there's a lot of dunking on him as well. Uh, that seemed respectful, which I uh, appreciated. I thought, you know, so uh, that was fun. Look, we should not talk about impersonations, right, John? And good afternoon, everybody. Hey, that's my impersonation. I am terrible at impersonations, as we know. Uh, of course he does. He, I, I, I was the first one in there. Now my sidekick gets in there. So was, that a good, was that <laughs> no. a good friend, Tessa? <laughs> that, was that was like a true Marylander doing an impersonation of Mike Francesa. John, so it's not easy to do impersonations. So, yeah, I would say Keyshawn has the advantage over I you. Take my hat off to him. Take my hat off to him. <laughs> good job, Keyshawn. Uh, all right, that's going to do it. Thank you to Burke Magnus, uh, number two at ESPN uh, executive, uh, for joining us. Really informative and really enjoyed that conversation. John, this was fun. Uh, and also, I want to just Everyone, thank you. A lot of real nice feedback about the Michael Nathanson interview from last week. Uh, He's one of the biggest uh, media analysts uh, in the country, world, I don't know, universe. Uh, And he uh, gave us a lot of insight into what the future of media is. So go back and listen to that one from last week if you missed it. Um, And then uh, we got some exciting guests coming up the next few weeks that uh, we're looking forward to. for you to hear uh and so uh if you can if you can you know give the five stars give a review that's very helpful and very appreciated it gets plural hey thanks for everybody for listening